Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Welcome to module 2.4 of the second week. And just to remind you, what we discussed in the last module was we took our expression for conductivity that we had obtained actually last week and showed how you could connect it to the standard Drude formula, the one that you learn in freshman physics, the one that most of us kind of carry in our head and the one that usually shapes our thinking, namely that sigma is equal to Q square tau over m times the density of electrons, that is number of electrons per unit length, if it's one dimension, per unit area, if it's two dimensions, per unit volume, if it's three dimensions. So this is the formula that you kind of carry in your head. And often people take the conductivity and divide it by the carrier density, this electron density, and then the quantity you get, that's what you usually define, call the mobility. And with any conductor, when you do perform experiments, one of the quantities you try to measure is this mobility, which is conductivity divided by the electron density. And the, of course, the implication is that ordinarily conductivity should be proportional to the number of electrons or this electron density. And what I want to point out here is that, well, if you did not have a parabolic relation, and a good example of that is, say, graphene, where energy-momentum relation is linear rather than parabolic, E is proportional to P rather than P square, and in solids in general, you could have more complicated energy-momentum relations. Okay. But the point is, if it was not parabolic, then you see this mass should be used with caution in the sense that the mass actually is kind of not a constant. And in graphene especially, as we'll see, the mass keeps increasing as you go up in energy. What that means is that if you did an experiment where you gradually change this electrochemical potential, so at first you are here and you have a certain number of electrons and you keep raising it, and as you raise it, you have more and more electrons. And you might think, well, if I now take the conductivity and divide it by the electron density, that should give me the mobility. Well, what you'd find is that as you raise your electrochemical potential, the mobility would just keep going down. Why? Well, not because the mean free time is getting any shorter or anything necessarily, because usually when mobility goes down, you figure, well, maybe the electrons with that energy have a shorter mean free time. But the point is in a situation like this, the mobility could be going down simply because the mass is increasing. So it is as if when you fill it up and you have more electrons, the so electrons up here are much heavier, quote unquote, than the electrons down here. So it is as if just the mass increased. And, and all experiments show that indeed when you measure mobility versus electron density, for graphene, the mobility does go down. Go down in a way that you'd expect, really, just from the fact that the mass is increasing. So this is an example of a case where, you see, this simple picture we carry in our head needs to be qualified. Otherwise, a lot of results, a lot of well-established results can look pretty puzzling. Okay. So the main thing I'd like to show you is, for example, in graphene, actually, instead of conductivity being proportional to electron density, we'd actually expect it to be proportional to the square root of the electron density. And let me explain how we get that. So the way we do it is, you see, what we had done in the last module, if you remember, we started from our expression. And the point I made in the last module, I want to repeat again, that this expression of conductivity in terms of the density of states and the diffusion coefficient, that really is the general one that one should normally use. The Drude formula is really an approximation that 
sometimes works, but if they don't agree or if you don't quite know what to use for mass or how to use it, the formula one should fall back on is the one that we obtained last week. Really, that's this one. So what I showed in the last module was how this could be rewritten in this form provided mass was equal to, this was defined as P over V. And this also again is worth noting because in the literature when people talk about effective mass, there are various ways in which they define it. And this is not necessarily the only one you'll see. You'll see some expressions which look like one over M is equal to dv dp or which is like second derivative of e with respect to p. This is actually what you'll see as the definition of mass in many textbooks. But the point I want to make is that in the problems we are discussing, if you want to get consistent results, you really should view mass as P over V and not any other definition really. Now what I want to show is next is that from here once we take into account the fact that the mass itself is kind of energy dependent, you'll find that the conductivity instead of being proportional to N will actually become proportional to square root of N. So that's what I'll be doing and what that graph up there shows is what you get if you plot the conductivity as a function of electron density for graphene using these numbers. And there's been many experiments and I cite one of them here which you can compare to just to show that you know experimentally also this is just the kind of thing you normally see. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so what I want to explain then is how we get an expression for conductivity that is proportional to the square root. So earlier we had obtained an expression for this n as a function of p for one, two and three dimensions. We are now talking about graphene which is a two dimensional conductor. As I had mentioned before, basically what it consists of is one layer, one mo thin monolayer from the surface of graphite. That is graphite as you know is a well known solid where these different layers are very weakly coupled to each other so they peel off easily one from the other and what was and one of the major developments of the last decade was that people were able to actually peel off essentially a monolayer from the surface and make measurements on it and that's what is usually referred to as a graphene. That's this one monolayer of carbon atoms arranged in a hexagonal lattice. And in graphene it's believed that around the chemical potential the energy momentum relation has this linear form. Okay. Now since it's, we are dealing with a two dimensional conductor then I'll use just the two dimensional version of this which is we put a d is equal to 2 and we use the second one here, the pi w l. Now, the expression for conductivity that we have, that we already have, looks like q square tau times v over p. That's what is written there as 1 over mass and then n over w. Now if the energy momentum relation looks like this, then you can see that the velocity which is defined as derivative of E with respect to momentum, that's just a constant V0. And this is of course very different from the usual parabolic relation where velocity is proportional to momentum is p over m of course, but here it is a constant. So we could write here v0, that's velocity. Now the question is what about p? Well we could use this relation to relate p back to n. So that way 
we can eliminate the p from here and we'd have an expression for conductivity in terms of n alone. And so, the way that would go then is, from here, I can write p over h is equal to n over pi w l square root. So all I did is p over h squared is n divided by pi w l and then I take square root on both sides, so that's it. So instead of this p here then, so I could take off the p from here and instead replace it with what I have from here, right? So you'd have a this, this is like 1 over p, so I'll write this here as this is equal to h times that's it. So instead of the p, I have put in what I obtained from that relationship, that's it. So I can take this off from here. So now if I simplify this a little bit, I think you'll get q squared over h. See that's the quantum of conductance as you may recognize from week one. Q squared over h. That is this v0 tau. And you'll notice there is n, there's this electrons per unit area, but then there's a square root of electrons per unit area. So you get square root of pi times, let's write this. Yeah, I think I got all the factors. So that is basically it. So sigma is proportional to the square root of electron density rather than the directly proportional to electron density. And, and the quantity that is appearing here is like the mean free path. It's like mean free time times the velocity. As again, as you know, there is this factor that you have to insert. It is some, some number of the order of one times the mean free path. Yeah. But this would then be the expression for conductivity in, in graphene. It won't be proportional to n. You would actually expect it to be proportional to square root of n. And that's the plot you see up there, actually. You'll see these, and there's two plots, one corresponding to a particular choice of the mean free path, and the other cor corresponding to a different choice of the mean free path out there. Now, in terms of actually interpreting experiments, let me just add one more point that I've kind of glossed over so far. And that is that, well, when we, I said that when you talk about electrons in a solid, one of the very important simplifying concepts that people understood early in the early days of solid state physics is that electrons in a solid behave almost as if they are in vacuum, but with a certain energy momentum relationship. That it may not be p square over 2m as in vacuum, it could be something else, or it could be a different mass. But given a certain energy momentum relationship, you could understand the behavior of electrons in a solid. Now to that, there is one more concept that we need to add, and that is that in solids often there are multiple valleys involved. So actually even ordinarily, electrons, there are these two spins that you have to account for. So right now I never brought that up. We say that well, electrons have these states given by a certain energy momentum relation. But one of the things we'll talk a little more about later in the course is that usually these states come in pairs. So anytime there is states available for say upspins, there's an equal corresponding amount for downspins. And so when we calculate density of states, whatever number we get, you need to multiply it by two. 
because there's upspin and downspin. Now what is more is that in many solids there are all these valleys that are involved. That is, you have a overall energy momentum relationship may look something like, let me draw it here. So energy versus momentum in the overall solid may look something like this with the electrochemical potential running somewhere here. And what you then do is you say, well, basically we got these three valleys and around each one you have some kind of an energy momentum relation. And of course the three usually don't have to be identical, but in many cases the different valleys are have the same mass because one of them may be in the x direction for momentum, another may be in the y direction, etc. And these are accounted for then with this overall g factor, uh, the factor that we call the degeneracy factor g, which is equal to 2 for the number of spins, as I mentioned, times the number of valleys. And so the way you do it is calculate conductivity as if you got just one valley, as if nothing else to worry about, just one. Good. But then if you have say six valleys, that's fine. At the end of the day, multiply the answer by two, no, by six. In any case, you have to multiply it by two to account for the two spins. Because whatever we discuss for, for electrons without talking about spins, there's a one for up spins, one for down spins. And it gives, because the two are kind of what electrical engineers would say in parallel, that is this conducts and this conducts together, they conduct twice as much current, which means twice as much conductance, half as much resistance. And so you always have to multiply by the two anyway for the spin. And then in, depending on the solid involved, we have to include the valleys. So when you're trying to model then the conductivity of any solid, first question we ask is what is the energy momentum relation? The, another question if you want to really get con quantitative and look at experiments is the number of valleys. And that in the context of graphene, that number would be two, which means our degeneracy factor G would be two for spin and two for valleys would be four. And that would have to be factored in as described in the notes. I won't go through it, but in the notes it's explained where the G goes in, that degeneracy factor, which is needed if you're trying to get numbers to compare with experiment.